Fluids are anything that flows. Fluids include gases, like air, and liquids, like water. Nearly all living things on Earth live in some kind of fluid environment. And interaction with that fluid environment is an important aspect of adaptation and function for all living things. A fish living in a stream, for example, must navigate through the dense fluid environment of water. To do so, the fish has to propel itself through a material that has mass, inertia, and resistance to flow, a unique property of fluids called viscosity. A bird flying in the sky must manipulate momentum in the less dense fluid environment of air. And this means that the energy birds expend flying around interacts with their fluid environment in a much different way from fish. To complicate things farther, microorganisms live in a much different fluid environment than do large creatures like ourselves. And this is true whether the fluid is air or water. And just to make things even more interesting, living things also make fluids, like mucus, for example. And these biological fluids usually have some very interesting properties. Just like biological materials, these biological fluids are important aspects of the interaction of life with their fluid environment. So, we begin this next module of Physics of Life by delving into just what fluids are, what their properties are, how to measure these properties, and what makes fluids distinctive from solids. Fluids are any material that flows. Fluids include gases, like air, liquids, like water, biologically made fluids, like mucus, and a plethora of other interesting fluids. To make a fluid flow, work must be done. Work is force times distance. The force that makes a fluid flow can come from pressure, gravity, changes of density, or any of a number of other sources of potential energy, and we're going to explore all of these. The study of fluids is germane to a physics of life because, in a deep sense, life is fluid. Living things consist mostly of water, which is usually contained within some kind of envelope, like skin, a sheet of connective tissue, or a cell membrane. More to the point, nearly all living things on Earth live in a fluid, either air, water, or some kind of self-created fluid environment. And, of course, life makes fluids. All this talk of matter in motion, force, work, and power should seem very familiar because we dealt with them extensively in the biomechanics module of this course. There, we typically were talking about solid materials, things like bones, chitin tubes, tendons, etc. Where we did get into fluids was in the context of hydrostatic skeletons. Even there, though, our approach was to treat water as a kind of solid material, which we could do because water is incompressible. But there's much more to fluids than that. So let's talk first about how to think about fluids. Fluids are indistinct in shape, so let's start with just an arbitrary parcel of fluid represented by this cube. The cube has a certain volume, uppercase V, and because fluid is matter, it has a certain mass, m. Now, imagine this parcel of fluid being put into motion at some velocity, lowercase v. Because the parcel of fluid is matter in motion, it has a certain momentum, given by this equation, where momentum, p, is equal to the mass times the velocity. Because fluids are indistinct, however, we have to recast this a little bit. Rather than the parcel having mass, we rather speak in terms of the fluid's density, rho, which is the mass divided by the volume. Fluids cannot really be divided into nice discrete parcels, as we're doing here. We'll be speaking in terms of parcels anyway, just because it makes it conceptually easier to illustrate some important things about fluids. But we have to remember that density, rather than mass, is the important property here. Momentum, therefore, is no longer the product of mass and velocity, but now the product of density and velocity. Because fluids are indistinct, any parcel of fluid cannot exist independently of the rest of the fluid. One parcel, shown here in orange, will be adjacent to another parcel, outlined here in blue. 
Because the parcels are independent of one another, the orange parcel might be traveling at a certain velocity, while the blue parcel might be traveling at a slower velocity. This means there'll be a momentum difference between the two parcels. The momentum of the parcel in orange will be greater than the momentum of the parcel in blue, simply because the parcel in orange is traveling at a faster velocity. This relative motion, the differential in velocity, dv, is a kind of motion known as shear. We'll be talking a lot about shear. When you have shear motion between adjacent parcels of fluid, there will be a certain friction between the two, and this will result in a transfer of momentum from the faster moving parcel to the slower moving parcel. Because momentum is conserved, the transfer of momentum from the orange parcel to the blue parcel will result in a decline of velocity of the orange parcel and an increase of velocity of the blue parcel. This transfer of momentum, dp, is the essence of another important property of fluids, namely viscosity. Before going on, I want to reiterate an important point. Fluids do not occur as discrete little parcels as we've been depicting here. We're framing our discussion in terms of parcels just for convenience, because this makes it easy to illustrate such things as momentum and shear. Real fluids, in contrast, are continuous, and this means that motions within the fluid can be heterogeneous. When we're dealing with a solid material, there are no such internal heterogeneities. What makes fluids distinctive is that inhomogeneities of motion can exist within a continuous body of fluid. Shear flow, for example, is a simple type of inhomogeneity. Shear flow describes any kind of motion where one part of the fluid moves faster with respect to another. The difference can be large, or it can be slow, or it can be relative motion within the fluid. When there are inhomogeneities of flow, there will be transfer of momentum within the fluid. We've portrayed momentum transfer as discrete, that is, from one discrete parcel of fluid to another. But in fact, the transfer of momentum within these inhomogeneities of flow is continuous. Let's now take a more general look at shear flows and viscosity as a general property of fluids. Viscosity can be thought of as a kind of internal fluid friction, but we can better define it quantitatively by relating two quantities to one another. On the x-axis is the shear rate, gamma, which is simply the differential of internal velocity within a fluid. This has units of inverse seconds. On the y-axis is the shear stress, tau, which is the momentum that is transferred through shear motion within the fluid. Recall from Newton's laws of motion that momentum change is a force. The force is built into the shear stress, which has units of pascal seconds. Pascals is a unit of pressure, which is force per unit area. The relationship between these two quantities for a typical fluid is a straight line. This means that increasing shear rate transfers more momentum through the fluid. The slope is the differential of shear stress over the differential of shear rate. This slope defines the fluid's viscosity. If this is looking familiar, it should. This graph is the fluid analog of the stress-strain curve for solid materials, which, you'll recall from biomechanics, plots stress versus dimensionless strain. The slope of the line in that instance represents the elastic modulus of the material. The slope of the line in the shear stress shear rate curve represents the fluid's viscosity. Viscosity varies between different fluids. A steeper slope, which indicates a higher rate of momentum transfer, signifies a higher viscosity fluid. Let's put some numbers to this. The viscosity of water is about 1 millipascal second. Honey, for example, is a high viscosity fluid with viscosity of 2 to 10 pascal seconds, roughly 3 to 4 orders of magnitude more viscous. If the relationship between shear stress and shear rate is shallower, that signifies a lower viscosity fluid. Air, for example, has a viscosity of about 20 micropascal seconds, roughly 3 orders of magnitude smaller than water's. 
If the curve is linear, this signifies a type of fluid known as a Newtonian fluid. The Newtonian fluid is the fluid analog of the Hookean material for solid materials. Remember from our discussions of the stress-strain curve that solids can be non-Hookean in their behaviors. That is to say that the stress-strain curve need not be linear. The elastic modulus can vary with strain. Similarly, fluids can be non-Newtonian, and they are signified in the same way, that is, with the shear stress shear rate curve. As a point of reference, a Newtonian fluid is one in which the slope of the shear stress shear rate curve is linear. That is to say, the viscosity is constant over all shear rates. A non-Newtonian fluid, by implication, does not have a constant viscosity over all shear rates. One type of non-Newtonian behavior is described as shear thinning. In this instance, the viscosity is high at low shear rates, as indicated by the steep slope at low shear rates, and lessens as the shear rate gets higher, again indicated by the shallowing slope at higher shear rates. In contrast, shear thickening fluids exhibit low viscosity at small shear rates and become more viscous at higher shear rates, again indicated by the increasing slope of the shear stress shear rate curve at higher shear rates. There is also an unusual type of non-Newtonian fluid known as plastic fluids, also sometimes called viscoelastic fluids. We've already encountered this type of material in the biomechanics module with respect to ductile failure. In this instance, the fluid behaves as a solid until stress approaches a critical value known as the yield stress. Further stress will cause the fluid to flow, perhaps as a Newtonian fluid. An example of a viscoelastic fluid would be jello. Jello sits as a solid block of gelatin at low shears, but if the jello is subjected to higher shears, it liquefies and flows like a fluid. All these behaviors have analogs in the stress strain curve for solid materials, which distinguish Hookean materials with a constant modulus of elasticity from non Hookean materials in which the modulus varies with strain. Viscosity is a specific property of materials that flow, that is, fluids. Even though we can conceive of viscosity as a kind of fluid friction, viscosity really is a means whereby momentum flows within fluids in which there are inhomogeneities of flow velocity. Because momentum is a conserved quantity, we can begin to approach fluid flow as a phenomenon of energetics. As we've already done many times already in this class, we try to bring our analysis to a point where we can apply conservation of energy principles. It's also important to realize that viscosity is a property of fluid materials. What viscosity does, that is, transfers momentum throughout fluids, only happens in a regime of shear flow, and that is when there are gradients in velocity within the fluid.